today we will be discussing your recent book, Russia in Flames. So can you just begin by telling our viewers a little bit about the book, about its arguments, and about what you wanted to do by writing it? Well, the book has an interesting origin, which was that I hadn't planned to write this book. It was an assignment. I had a relationship <laughs> with an interesting editor at Oxford University Press, and it was about uh, 2011, something like that, and he said, you know, the anniversary of, of 1917 is coming up. Um, you've been in the field of Russian history for your whole career. Had you ever thought of writing a history of 1917? And I said, you know, I've always written books on very idiosyncratic, odd um, subjects that interested me, but I've never taken on the sort of the well, it's not true. My first book was on a revolution, the revolution of 1905. But 1917 is the big event in modern Russian history, and I had never gotten that near it. So I thought, and he said he had a series called Pivotal, Pivotal Moments in World History. And of course, this is obviously one. And I thought, what an interesting idea. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So typically, I wrote a book that I wanted to write. And if it was published, which it was, that was well and good, and this time it was a book, sort of a set piece. Mm -hmm. So I started writing it, and I discovered that, of course, m hundreds of books have been written on the subject. The difference is that since 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, archives were opened, historians in Russia, in the successor states, started to go and discover new material to write, to publish, to think in new ways about the old subjects, so that the whole framework of 1917, which was somewhat off-putting before, very ideological, very pro and contra, mm -hmm. had, had shifted. And what I discovered in writing was that was very exciting. So almost as exciting as the challenge of putting everything together was this new view, this opportunity to think again about a subject that had been thought about many, many mm -hmm. times, a sort of de-ideological uh, perspective on it. Mm -hmm. And so that became very exciting. And the other thing that happened was that uh, in the field of Russian history, overall, a lot more attention had been paid to the scope of empire. We all know it was an empire before 1917, and of course the, the word was there, but the idea of how the dynamic of imperial rule mm -hmm. was essential to the nature of pre-1907 imperial Russia. Mm -hmm. And of course this was somewhat stimulated also by the fall of communism when the thing Soviet Union broke apart in national terms. So almost without planning it, without a program in mind, I found myself thinking, in order to tell this story in the year 2017, you have to really take on the big picture. Mm -hmm. That was a fatal decision. <laughs> it meant that the story was enormous and very complicated, but also very fascinated. So this is how the nature, the origin, and the nature of the project uh, evolved. Mm -hmm. Right. It is a huge story, and it's a, a huge book to match the huge story. So can you talk to us a little bit about the process of researching and writing this? How did, where did you begin? How did you begin? And then how did it unfold from there? Well, the other thing that, uh, and the name of this editor, by the way, is Timothy Bent at Oxford University Press in New York. Um, and he said, this book is going to be a book for the general educated reader. So it's not just a book for the field, for your colleagues. It can't be just engaging in methodological arguments and so on. It has to inform this general reader. It had to have a story. It had to have a narrative. And so aside from the imperial idea, it also had to tell the political story. Now, I was known in the field for cultural history and other kinds of approaches. So I started with the story. What happened? And of course, I had already been working a lot on the history of the First World War, which also had a centenary, <laughs> 2014. And I thought to myself, having written on 1905, that there was a time period that had to be covered, as well as a geographical period. So 1905 as background, the First Revolution, World War I as the, really the instigation of the collapse of the old regime, and the dynamics of that leading into the year 1917, the revolution itself in that sense, the political events, and then the Civil War, which lasted until 1921. You could argue you should take the story further, but I thought that was a nice beginning and, and an end. So I had to say to myself, what does this reader need to know? Mm -hmm. So a historian might say, too much attention to Lenin, but 
excuse me, <laughs> you can't tell the story of 1917 without a lot of attention to Lenin. Mm -hmm. You might not conclude that he was the reason for everything, but mm -hmm. you had to be there. And you had to mm -hmm. introduce him in a way that wasn't condescending to this mm -hmm. educated reader, but that provided enough information. Mm -hmm. um, and in my mind, a book, even if it's a narrative in form, has to have an argument. Mm -hmm. So the challenge was to embed the argument, whatever it turned out to be, in the story itself. And that was mm -hmm. my aspiration. I don't know whether mm -hmm. I succeeded, but uh, mm -hmm. that was how the project unfolded. Right. And so this project took you away both from the previous themes you had worked on and, as you said, from maybe the previous audiences you had written for. It's a book for the public as well as for, for an academic audience. Did that change your writing process at all, the way you went about it technically or imaginatively? Uh, yes. Um, so my first book was on the revolution of 1905, and that was a social history. So it was very much an analysis of social movements. And there's some of that in this book, actually, as well. Um, and my other work was more or less was essayistic or analytic also, but in terms of <coughs> late 19th century culture, or I wrote on religion, on the history of law and medicine, so they were problem-oriented, most of it. Um, and this one, uh, again, I had to pay a lot of attention to how to construct a narrative. Now, the trick with this book is, until the end of 1917, it's more or less one narrative thread, because you have a government, you have a state, in turmoil, in trouble, but still there's a center. A after the Bolshevik coup in October 1917, there's more than one center. You have many narratives. And the trick, which I'm not, I'm not certain at all that I solved the challenge, is to, at the same time, show the different strands that emerge, the nationalist breakaway movements, the regional stories, the story of Siberia, uh, the simultaneous and intersecting conflicts of the Civil War, have them be comprehensible in their own terms and somehow manage to show how they intersect without driving the, re the reader crazy. Mm -hmm. Also, it had to be vivid. It had to have personalities. It had to have some sense of the texture. Mm -hmm. So some, a few readers have already complained, why are there so many people in this book? <laughs> I tried to make the stories of people not merely decorative, but actually exemplary. So a certain mm -hmm. type of person or a certain type of background. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, for example, in discussing the peasant movements, there was one very outstanding leader who, and by talking, telling his story, you can really sort of bring it to life. Mm -hmm. So I tried to be coherent as a narrative, to be um, enticing, so to mm -hmm. speak, in terms of characters, personalities, um, mm -hmm. and, and events. These are very, a lot of very dramatic events. So that was a different kind of challenge, mm -hmm. yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. This is a, a broader question, maybe about the writing process, uh, perhaps aimed at our graduate student audience who okay. sometimes uh, wonders where to begin writing, how to write, how do historians write? So can you walk us through what an average day in your life looks like <laughs> in writing Russia in Flames? How do you deal with writer's block, the frustrations that come with dealing with such a big topic? Well, one thing I, w yes, uh, one thing I want to say about this book, is, which I, is also different from what I have uh, done before, is this book is built 95% on secondary literature mm -hmm. or documentary material that was prepared by other people. There's very little, there's some primary research in the sense that I myself went to the archives and, and looked at the material, let's say, on the pogroms of 1919-20 at YIVO, which I did. But mostly at that level of a narrative, you can't afford to go in yourself at every moment, even if you wanted to. And also, since 1991, all this new material document is there. So my research process did not include, in this case, sitting in an archive and then taking the notes and assimilating and organizing it. Mm -hmm. It involved finding among the secondary works the ones that had the kind of information and the interesting sort of inspiring arguments that got me thinking about how to think about something. So if you read the book, you'll notice many chapters say, this chapter owes a lot to so-and-so, because I really wanted to give credit. Um, it's uh, sometimes I felt I got to be sure that I'm really using it in my own way, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of work that went into this book not done by me. Mm -hmm. Process, 
get up in the morning, get to the computer, and sit there. <laughs> and uh, Regenstein Library was absolutely key. This is a fabulous library. Um, I have the experience of the library at Yale, which is wonderful, but Regenstein is absolutely superb in our field. Mm -hmm. uh, modern European history, this whole, if it, the latest thing, rare publications that you wouldn't imagine being on the shelf, and then an enormous uh, resource was the Hathi, or H I don't know how to pronounce it actually, Hathi Trust, mm -hmm. where digitized material. So to a greater extent than any other book, I could sit in my room. Um, and the question was, again, it's the same process, reading, assimilating, choosing what's important, um, uh -huh. and rewriting it about a hundred times. Uh -huh. And I think it's a really valuable point as access in Russia can become more difficult and restrictive for some topics to make the point that you can do all of this without working extensively in an archive. Um, can you say a little bit more about um, other places that you've done research for in Russian history, other ar archival repositories or other libraries that are particularly near and dear to your heart, other than Regenstein? <laughs> well, I, I would say that the library most dear or dearest to my heart, other than Regenstein, is the Slavonic Library in Helsinki. Uh, where I have spent many, many, many months over many, many years. Actually, I think I first went there in 1971. Um, and uh, it is a fabulous library, and the whole environment and, and the personnel are wonderful. I did work, did some of the work on uh, the war there, mm -hmm. and many of the illustrations come from uh, Helsinki. They had a fabulous, have a fabulous collection of World War I postcards, mm -hmm. which some of which are used as illustrations I in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, YIVO also was very interesting for the purposes of the Civil War and the telling the Jewish story, the pogrom story, and partly the Ukrainian story. Mm -hmm. um, and another challenge of this book actually is that linguistic. Mm -hmm. So when you get into empire, uh, Russian, German, and French were the three basic working languages of the field. And in over the past decade, I've acquired Polish, so Polish, OK. Um, Ukrainian, oh dear, Ukraine is a big part of the story and I can fake it to a certain extent, but actually, um, however, it was very interesting that some of the new writing on Ukraine, some of it's in English, some Ukrainian historians who have written in Russian in order to speak across the divide still. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to some extent to access that and I had a very interesting dialogue with some Ukrainian scholars mm -hmm. in North America. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to, you know, the Caucasus or mm -hmm. Finland or the Baltic states, yeah. you have to recognize your own limitations. Yeah, it's a daunting problem. Um, another really unusual and I think remarkable thing about the book is the number of memoirs that you yourself worked through, of the very vivid memoirs that we have of this period and you've done a lot to assimilate them. I guess that makes me wonder um, about the relationship between your voice and the voice of your authors. Obviously as you read these memoirs you're of course shaped by their views but you're of course forming your own views as, as you read them. So can you speak a bit about that relationship in particular with regard to these first person um, sources? Well, I, I, of course, one is so happy to find a memoir uh, of any given moment because it does give you a kind of depth and a perspective mm -hmm. and vividness you otherwise don't have. Um, I was interested in the memoirs of political actors. Um, and of course, you realize you have sympathy for some and <laughs> not for others. Um, but I was looking for memoirs that illuminated a particular moment. Uh, some characters I knew already. Mm -hmm. Some, at least, a couple of these characters are carryovers. Characters, actors, historical personages, carryovers from my earlier work. Mm -hmm. um, Vladimir Nabokov, the father of the novelist, uh, Maxim Vinaver, uh, uh, a prominent Polish, Russian, Jewish activist, a liberal, liberal party. And back to your point about archives, I just want to say some of the works I drew on. I, I talked a lot about new work, mm -hmm. but some of the classics in our field, and you might want to know really good books on the Russian Revolution from the pre-1991 days. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Bill Rosen, William Rosenberg's book on the liberals. It is filled with archival material, none of it in Russia. It was yeah. published in, now I can't remember, 1970s or something like that. And it stands up to this day. Uh, so he went from the Hoover to the to mm -hmm. the Bakhmiet of the to Columbia. Mm -hmm. There is lots of material 
in North America and the United States. And in fact, some Russian scholars have come to America mm -hmm. to, to mine, publish, edit material, uh, some of these uh, important cadet material that ended up in the, in the United States mm -hmm. and publishing them in Russian for Russian readers. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I would say Toshi Hasegawa's book mm -hmm. on the February Revolution stands up. It's fantastic. Even though he's changed his mind a little bit given the more recent publications, some of that work was research was done in the Soviet Union but not in archives. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, the archival I would say, I don't want to say that it's a fetish to want archives because many of the documents I rely on came from the archives, only I wasn't the one who, right. who found them. Mm -hmm. So there are, there's a lot of primary material in this book. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there's been a huge resurgence of interest, at, as we would expect in, 19, in 2017, about 1917 mm -hmm. at this centenary moment. Um, and your book has also, I think, been in dialogue with a number of other books that have mm -hmm. come out at the moment. So perhaps we can close by reflecting on what you think we've learned new about 1917 in 2017 with this new resurgence of literature and these new discussions about the revolution? Um, well, I would say I have uh, in, in actual dialogue, conversation. Mm -hmm. um, there are, there were a couple of books that came out almost simultaneously uh, on the revolution itself. Though I must say, in, in celebration of the centenary of, two th of 1917, it's been interpreted broadly as a year to think about the Soviet Union. So some of the major publications have not been about the revolution. They've been about Soviet society, Soviet, history, which is perfectly legitimate. Um, the two books closest to my own were the first one was uh, by Steve Smith, S.A. Smith, also with Oxford, um, uh, and he wrote a history from 1905 through 28, I think. And he's a colleague with whom I've been in dialogue for years and years, and he has a more sympathetic view of the socialist project than I ended up certainly having <laughs> after getting going through uh, this material. Um, he's not uncritical. He also takes this more economic social history approach to the story. Uh, it's also shorter. I wish mine were shorter. You know the famous saying, if I had more time I would have written less. That is definitely true. <laughs> um, but we have had very interesting conversations about where to put the emphasis and how to evaluate mm -hmm. things and how to think about it. Another book that came out very recently uh, by Toshi Hasegawa, who was the author of the February, big book on the February Revolution. Oh, I want to add also Alexander Rabinowitz's mm -hmm. books on uh, Bolshevik politics in 1917 from the political. Uh, I don't always agree with his uh, conclusions, but he's a meticulous historian, and those books are incredibly valuable if you want to know, tell me, what happened on what day, and who was doing what? And he's very careful, and they were still, after all these years. He is an archival historian. So Toshi Asagawa just recently published a book on crime in Saint Peter in Petrograd during the revolution, and this is not only interesting in itself, but it's part of a, 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 a tendency in the current literature on our side and over there uh, to reject the political story in favor of a view of chaos and violence. This is a trend also in thinking about the First World War, this sense that it's a sort of a, a kind of anthropological wave of violence that overwhelms as part of the falling apart of society, which opens the door to perhaps authoritarian solutions and so on. Um, and Toshi, who's a very smart historian, said we have to pay, spend more time thinking about not political violence, but violence per se. And my argument with him is I think that it's not, it's very hard sometimes to see where politics begins and ends. Mm -hmm. And some of this mass violence is, is chaotic, extremely brutal and violent, and one has to put that into the story. It's not some beautiful airbrushed proletariat. On the other hand, a lot of these mass movements were structured organized, had purposes, had a sort of, not an ideology, but had more of a more coherence and purposefulness than the notion of mere violence mm -hmm. would suggest. But I think partly in this, in Russia and even in the West, there's a reaction against the very old Soviet narrative that it was a nicely organized political movement of conscious proletarians. I'm oversimplifying, but basically this was the idea. So Russian historians in in reaction against that, like to say, well, no, no, no. Uh, mm -hmm. It was more a collapse, more a crisis. Um, and I think you have to integrate. You can't give up on the political story. Um, mm -hmm.
Well, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation, and it was wonderful. And thank you for your questions. <laughs> thank you. Okay, excellent. Is there anything?